Hey everyone, my name is Erica and I'm a traditional media artist and today I'm going to be sharing with you a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to paint a fun Halloween jack-o'-lantern using the Pipa's color sheets. Before getting started with today's tutorial, I want to go over the supplies that you're going to be needing. To begin, you're going to have to create your own outline sketch before getting started with the painting process. I am going to be providing you my own outline sketch for this jack-o'-lantern in case you'd like to transfer it onto your sheet of watercolor paper and completely skip over the freehand drawing phase. My downloadable outline sketch is going to be available for you right along with this video here on Viviva's website. If you do decide to transfer it onto your sheet of watercolor paper, you can use something like tracing paper or any other sort of transferring method that works for you. This said, if you'd like to create your outline sketch on your own, by all means, go for it. In just a bit, you're going to see how I work on that. I personally enjoy using an HB drawing pencil very, very lightly when I am creating that preliminary outline sketch so that my pencil doesn't show through my transparent paint at the end of the painting process. Creating that preliminary outline sketch very, very lightly and not pressing down on your paper too hard when you're creating that drawing is also helpful because you'll be ensuring that you're not scratching or damaging your watercolor paper and also that you're keeping everything clean enough so that your colors don't get muddied up with the graphite of your pencil. A soft graphite eraser is always something that I have on hand when I am creating that preliminary drawing so that I can make sure that I don't damage my paper with it whenever I am erasing any mistakes or refining shapes or anything along those lines. Moving on to the watercolor painting supplies that you're gonna be needing. And the first one, of course, is your set of watercolors or your Viviva color sheets. The next thing you're gonna be needing is at least one paintbrush. I'm gonna complete this entire painting using one paintbrush and it's gonna be a size 14 round brush. You're gonna need some sort of watercolor paper or paper that is intended for water soluble mediums. This can be a sheet of watercolor paper from a watercolor paper pad. It can be some sort of watercolor sketchbook. Even a sketchbook intended for mixed media will do. During this painting process, you're gonna see me do a bit of color mixing and I use a separate paint mixing palette for this. Having a separate paint mixing palette is important for me because not only am I going to have enough space to mix colors if I want to, but I'll also be able to add more water into individual colors to make the color more transparent if I need to. Something that I also always have on hand when I am painting with watercolor is an absorbent rag or a regular kitchen paper towel so that I can go in and absorb some excess water or paint or even create some texture along the way. And finally, of course, I also have my container with clean water. Once you're ready with all of these items, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so I'm really speeding through this drawing process so that we can get to the painting, but I really wanted you to get an idea for how I move along creating this preliminary outline sketch completely freehand. This is a drawing that I created from my imagination after having seen a bunch of different jack-o'-lantern ideas. Something that I also want to share with you is that before actually drawing on my sheet of watercolor paper, I take time to create little thumbnail sketches on a separate sheet of drawing paper or my regular sketchbook until I come up with an idea that I like and I then go ahead and draw on my sheet of watercolor paper so that I can ensure that I already know what I am drawing and I don't erase so much on my watercolor paper. I also made sure to come up with a nice looking background that I feel could add to the spooky Halloween theme. All right, so with that out of the way, it's now time to get started with our painting process. And the very first color that I am going to prepare on my color mixing palette is my slate black. This is the color that I'm going to be using for the night sky behind the jack-o'-lantern. And you could probably tell how easy it was for me to activate that color in my color sheets with just a tiny bit of water and a very gentle scribbling motion on a little tiny section of my color sheets and how I was able to bring a ton of color onto my color mixing palette. With my color already on my color mixing palette, I added a little bit more water to water it down a bit because I knew I would be adding in the color in layers in this night sky. 
I really wanted some areas in my sky to look a little bit more transparent and other areas to be a little bit more saturated. So by making sure that I am going in initially with a more translucent version of my black and then layering more black on top only into certain areas, I am ensuring that I am creating a nice variation in values and blacks in the night sky instead of just having one flat black. So right here you can see how I am covering up this entire sky area with my first layer of black and I am working around the moon, around the jack-o'-lantern and I am actually doing upwards flicking motions with my wrist in the little sections where I'm going to be painting in the grass. And I am doing my best to follow those little shapes that I created in my preliminary outline sketch making sure that I make those blades of grass look like they are getting thinner and thinner or more and more narrow as I am nearing that tip and using flicking motions really helps create that effect. So I am still using this negative painting technique in which I am painting all of the background area and really working around all of the subjects within this area, the moon, the jack-o'-lantern and the blades of grass. And once I have completed that initial layer of paint all throughout the sky area, I then go in with a second layer of paint and just work on moving that same paint around some areas here and there, even doing some lifting with my absorbent towel so that I can arrive at an uneven look, which is going to make it look a lot more believable. If you notice, once I finish painting in this area, the areas around the moon, which is a light source, are gonna end up looking lighter than the areas farther away from the moon, creating a nice light effect. And if you feel that this area is starting to look a little bit too flat, you can go back in with a clean and slightly dampened paintbrush, move the paint around a bit, reactivate it, or simply lift it up with your absorbent towel while it's still wet. This should help add some dimension into that area. Once I finished painting my background, I allowed everything to dry completely. I cleaned out all of the previous color from my paintbrush bristles. And once everything was dry, it was time to get started with painting in the pumpkin. And the color that I primarily chose for the pumpkin was the Dusk Orange, which is a beautiful bright orange in the Viviva color sheets. And just a moment ago, you probably saw me prepare two different color mixtures using my Dusk Orange on my color mixing palette. One of them has a lot more water in it than the other one, which is going to allow me to create a nice variation throughout the pumpkin. In other words, like I did with the sky, I want some areas to appear lighter and more translucent or transparent and other areas to look a little bit darker and more saturated in color. Remember that when we're working with watercolors, adding more water into your paint colors are gonna make them more transparent and adding more paint into your colors is gonna saturate and darken that color. And the idea here is to have a variety of lights and darks of all of your colors throughout your painting to make sure that nothing is too flat. Of course, we wanna bring in our knowledge of how light and shadow works so that we can make sure that we start developing the lighter areas in the places where it makes sense and the darker areas in the places of shadow where it would make sense. Something that I find very helpful is actually looking at reference photos of whatever kind of subject it is I am drawing or painting. And of course, taking in the location of the light source in the picture that we're painting into consideration is always very helpful. So I created that initial layer of dusk orange and then I started placing in a more saturated version of my dusk orange or the color mixture that didn't have that much water in it, only in the areas that I wanted to darken. And the other areas I left completely free of the second layer of color. After I placed in that second layer of dusk orange only into areas I wanted to darken, if I had any harsh edges uh, left around my shapes that I painted in, I went in with a clean and only slightly dampened paintbrush and ran my bristles along those edges to soften them out. Once that was done, it was time to get started with the little stem right on top of the pumpkin and this is a green that I created by mixing together viridian green and chrome yellow. 
you can play around with the ratios of your colors in your color mixture until you come up with something that you like. I would highly recommend testing out your colors on a scrap piece of watercolor paper the way that you're seeing me do right here before actually using them in your painting. And once you're ready, it's time to get started with that initial layer of green. And the same idea applies right here. We're trying to work from lighter and more transparent greens to darker and more saturated greens, which we're gonna be placing in the second layer of paint only in certain areas that we're intending to darken. When I was ready to start placing the darkest green in this area, I added in even more Viridian green to darken my color mixture. Whenever I am switching to painting a different area of my picture, I really take into account the texture and the overall form, the structure of whatever element it is that I am painting in, and I shift the way that I am using my paintbrush to better transmit or describe that texture or form. After I finished with that stem, I got started with painting in the grass area underneath a jack-o'-lantern. And for this, I am using the exact same color mixture that I was using for my stem. So my Viridian Green plus Chrome Yellow. The same thing applies here. We are working from lighter green to darker green. And right here, you're seeing me actually start placing my area of cast shadow right beneath my jack-o'-lantern using an even darker green color mixture that was created by adding even more Viridian green into that color mixture. And because that previous layer of paint was still quite wet, you can notice how this darker green that I start placing dissipates and gradiates softly into the lighter green, creating a nice wet on wet effect. Now, remember that watercolor is always going to expand and bleed into paper that is wet or even partially damp. So if you ever want to keep those edges between your different elements clean and sharp and not have those colors intermix and merge together, you need to allow the previous element or area of your painting to dry completely before painting in an area that is right beside that section that you just painted in. All right, so after finishing up with those layers of paint in my grass area, I removed all of the green from my paintbrush bristles and it was time to get started with painting in the inner section of the jack-o'-lantern. And because I really wanted to create this glowy effect coming from the inside of the jack-o'-lantern as if it has some sort of light inside of it, I really wanted to use a very bright yellow for this area, so I went for the chrome yellow once again, but I also wanted to bring in a second and even third color later on to really darken the darkest darks in this area and create a ton of contrast. So what I did was I first lay down that chrome yellow in my eyes and in the mouth, and then while that first layer of paint was still wet, I started adding in a bit of burnt umber into areas I wanted to darken. Make sure though, for example, in the eyes, you want that central part of the eyes to only have that chrome yellow shining through. You don't want to cover that central part of the eyes with your burnt umber. The same thing with the mouth. I made sure to keep some sections of pure chrome yellow shining through and primarily added the burnt umber in the edges. Because we're placing the burnt umber on top of the chrome yellow while it's still wet, the burnt umber should be gently dissipating into the previous lighter color, creating a nice soft transition or a wet on wet effect. If this is not happening for you, it means that your paper is starting to dry. I would recommend working on one eye at a time and then moving on to the mouth. At this point in the process, that chrome yellow and that burnt umber have been added in. And once they were dry, I decided to go back in and add further contrast and carve out those darkest darks in these areas by going into the very darkest areas with a bit of burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is a reddish brown that is gonna help us not only further darken darkest areas in the eyes and the mouth, but it's also going to help redden and distinguish the flesh inside of the pumpkin from the exterior of the pumpkin and add further creepiness to this pumpkin. 
By the point that I start adding in my burnt sienna, the previous layers of paint have already almost dried and I am left with hard looking edges. And I go in with a clean and slightly dampened paintbrush to soften edges out. It's not necessary to soften all of the edges out, I just do it here and there. All right, so once I was happy with the eyes and the mouth of the pumpkin and I was happy with that level of contrast, it was time to get started with one of the final parts of this process, which is gonna be to add more three-dimensionality to the exterior of the pumpkin. And the way that we do this is by darkening darkest values, creating transitions between lighter and darker values, etc. So to develop darker midtones and darkest darks in the exterior of my pumpkin, I prepare a brand new color mixer for myself with my vermilion from my color sheets, which is a red orange color that is darker than the previous orange that I was using in this area which is my dusk orange and once again I just add this darker orange in the areas that I actually want to make look darker so I take into consideration the structure of pumpkins and the location of the light source and only place this darker orange in these areas and after I have laid down enough color I go in with a clean and slightly dampened paintbrush to soften out edges and as you can see I leave a ton of the previous lighter orange completely shining through most of the pumpkin. The point here is not to cover up the previous lighter orange but to only develop darkest darks in the areas that we need to develop them because it's that variety of different values that is going to create that sensation of a bit of a three-dimensional form. If you start covering up all of the previous lighter orange, you're gonna start flattening everything out. All right, so right here, I am just working on the very final details for this pumpkin, carving out some darkest darks, adding in some little marks here and there, and then I'm gonna allow everything to dry completely. Remember that if you want to create a darker value, but you don't want it to get super, super dark, you can always just add more water into your vermilion color mixture to get it more translucent and use it as a transition color between your lighter oranges and your darker oranges. All right, you guys, so we're moving on to the very final stage of this process, and this is going to be to add in those stars and a few little details here and there. And to do this, I'm gonna be using a white acrylic paint pen to start adding in those stars in a very irregular way. I also add a bit of detail to the stem of the pumpkin, go over a few little blades of grass here and there, and we are done. I really hope that you enjoyed this tutorial using Viviva's color sheets. I had a ton of fun painting this jack-o'-lantern. If you liked it, make sure to leave a comment for us below letting us know what you'd like to see next and make sure to subscribe to Viviva's channel for more. Have a beautiful rest of the day and stay inspired. Bye guys.